God is no respecter of man, is a quote in the Bible, and that means God doesn't really play the game and go along with what you think. Uh, straight A's, let's say, in school. God doesn't sit there and go, oh man, you've got to get straight A's. Um, that means nothing. Uh, God is no respecter of our way of doing things. How much you get, did you get a raise? None of that has to do with God. It's really ourselves that, that reflects or, or has a meaning for. God is saying, how are you doing on a soul level? Are you getting closer to me? All that matters. That's what matters on the other side. I've said this many times. That you've, I'm sure you've heard me, but it, nothing else matters. Remember the song? Is this the real life or is this just fantasy? Caught in a landslide with no escape from reality. Open your eyes, look up to the skies and see. Bohemian Rhapsody, which ends with the words, nothing really matters. Anyone can see, nothing really matters to me. Even though that's a very melodramatic song, uh, because it was written by and sung by a very melodramatic soul, and the band Queen performing it melodramatically, it's, it really speaks volumes because nothing really matters. Ultimately, on a soul level, nothing matters but soul. Soul doesn't look at all about who you date, what food you eat. Soul never says, you know, by the way, what car are you driving now these days? The, the, the soul doesn't do that. And if the soul doesn't care, you can bet your ass that God doesn't care about such ridiculous things. So why don't we think for a second? Why don't we just try an experiment and, and look at ourselves and say, how much of my life does God care about? And or my soul care about? My soul, not my personality. You know, um, does my soul or God care about whether my car is a new car or if it's 10 years old? My house is 10 years old or is 30 years old? Does any of that matter? Does God or my soul care about how many children I've had, if any at all? Does it care if I get a divorce? Believe it or not, no. If you really take an honest look and if you have any depth of spirituality to you, you would realize that the only things you want to attribute to God and your soul would be things of your own selfish ego nature. Most anything we would, we would try to pin, like pin the tail on the donkey, uh, you know, pin the um, importance on the God, you know, or on the soul. And none of it sticks, none of it works. Think about that. How many of uh, these Facebook things I do, by the way, does that matter to God or my soul? Hmm, I guess so. There's a good thing. Um, whether I heal wounds from the past, do you think that matters to soul? I think so. And whether I'm still married to the person I married in the past, does that matter? Usually no. It's not stuff that matters. So to say it another way, God actually does not believe we're separate from God. God does not see us as on this, you know, planet, hurl, you know, hurling through space, um, pole shifts, earth changes, climatic changes, and so on and so on, you know, all the stuff that goes on, politics and war. I know people will tell you it does, and they should go to a different uh, Facebook feed, by all means. But if you're willing to listen to a different viewpoint, think about it. What matters? God doesn't see us as separate, but God does know that we believe we're separate. So God's not immune to knowing that we have a problem or that we're, we're somewhere. But God is just saying, come home. I love you, come home. And everything in our day-to-day -day life is an answer to that. It's, an e e it's either, believe it or not, I don't mean to sound um, irreverent, but everything God says is, I love you, come home. And everything we do is our answer. And our answer is either, thank you, I'm on my way, or screw you. So all your actions are one of those two things. To hell with you. And I say it that word, way not to be irreverent. It's to, to emphasize the, the rage we feel inside towards that call that love gives us. Whether that is terror, whether it's rage, there's a part of us that's saying, hell with you, God. I don't care about you, God. I know we don't think it out loud. I know we don't think it consciously. But there's a part of us that loathes heaven because, like in a sci-fi movie, you know, we're the creatures that have left and, and are terrified of going back. Now, I know even if you struggle with hearing this, you'll agree with me if you just hear it said differently, such as, Beloveds, we're afraid of our light. 
And some of us will go, oh, that's so beautiful, that's so poetic. So I'm saying the same thing. I'm just saying it with a little bit of attitude. Um, we are afraid of our light. But if we're afraid of our light and we're gods and goddesses, imagine how we must be afraid of the great light of God itself. If you think that your light is going to turn over a stone and show some of your creepiness, and you do have creepiness, and, you know, sometimes the creepiness is manifested as your choices and dates, or the creepiness is manifested in hobbies or habits. You know, we have some creepy things that we do or have done. If you think your light turns over the stone and shows those creepy things, makes you want to run. And running manifests in different forms, such as shutting off this feed or not wanting to hear this guy. It may look like because it's you don't agree with me, but it's quite possible that you don't like what you're hearing because I'm turning over some rocks and showing some creepy things about yourself. And it's not like I think um, I'm a god immune to that. Hell, I'll tell you my creepy things I've felt in my life. You know, things that I felt regret about, sadness, you know, just, you know, the horrible things I have felt in my life. And yet I'm not really, I don't think, such a bad guy. I, I've not done, I've not killed people. I, I don't think I've ever been overtly careless, you know, in my life. But I'm pretty honest about it. There are still things that I would love to have done differently. I would have loved to have succeeded more in, in, in um, uh, protecting my children from abuses that happened to them somewhere along the line from others. And, you know, there are things like that that I would love to have done differently, seen, you know, sooner and known about more and all that. So those things I'm very open about. And sometimes I've shared them and sometimes with tears because, because those things can make me sad. This world can make me sad. There are times I just look at it and think, man, oh man, the things that people do to each other. You know, um, all you have to do is just think about the details of things like the Holocaust and it's beyond disgusting. Human slavery of hundred years, a couple hundred years ago to human trafficking of today. I think all of it's repulsive. So I'm not giving you the goody good kind of a speech, a sweet new agey thing, but I am saying these two extremes. This world is heavy, dense, and it challenges those of us that are sensitive souls. Some of us come in hurt enough, tired enough, angry enough that we become thick skinned. We really do. Um, we just kind of create armor and we just go whatever and we, we show up here and we, we either just become part of the lower end, uh, no money and no good things in life, or we become the higher echelon, all the wealthy people that don't give a damn about anything worth giving a damn about. They don't care. They care about just their wealth or whatever. So there's all those kinds of people. But there are some of us, whether we're wealthy or not, that are thin-skinned, meaning really sensitive. And that, that, you know, I could say to you, isn't that unfortunate, beloveds? I, I, sometimes I'm just not in the mood, you know, for that. I just say it sucks, because it does. Uh, God agrees with me on that one. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's just not very cool. We come in very open and very sensitive. And so the, the shouting, the yelling, the anger, the betrayals, all that, it really weighs on us. And we tend towards then emotional um, responses to that. Emotional responses like depression, which I talked about at Unity of Sedona last week. Uh, emotional responses of, of fear and sadness because it weighs heavy on us. It's, I don't even know how I uh, do this really sometimes. I, I can tell you I do know how, but there's times when it feels like I don't even know how because of the quantity of stuff that I can hear on the planet on a daily basis. There are times when I feel kind of heavy and kind of just you know, the, the sigh and the sadness. As soon as I even start getting, like dropping into that and tuning into that and feeling that, I can already feel the shift even that much talking about it because I don't just say, Pah, it's just an illusion or, or uh, too bad or uh, they had lessons to learn. Those are some of the dumb things that some spiritual teachers will say. Well, those are the lessons. that You know what? We're all in this together and there's no lessons they have to learn. Even the lessons they're learning, we're learning. Uh, whatever it may be. The Holocaust didn't happen 80 years ago, 70 years ago, whatever. It's still happening. Those kinds of thoughts are still in people. Uh, those kinds of uh, rude thoughts, uh, controlling thoughts and hurtful thoughts, selfish thoughts, they're still in people. If they could get away with it, there's still people that would do that today. We think we're more civilized. They would still do it today. Um, getting into newspapers and editorials to keep it from happening actually doesn't keep it from happening. 
It only makes it happen in a more tactful uh, manner, flying in under the radar. But when people want to be hurtful, they're still hurtful. Um, you know, we could say there's no Holocaust, but the things that people are doing in the homes to their own children are, are just as gross. So we, we have to change. So what's going to do that? And the answer is we have to change inside. My job, any of us, my job is not to go out and fix it in the world by writing and shouting about it. My job, believe it or not, and this is hard for us to hear, my first job is to sit and say, wow, what is this bringing up in me? Holocaust, fear, anger, sadness. Let me look at what some of these events bring up in me and then uproot it. Uproot my anger, my sadness. Give it to God and replace it with something new. In other words, it's we're coming to Easter time. And this Sunday's uh, talk at Unity of Sedona will probably focus on something like that. But the idea is Easter is sort of a symbol of death, right? Crucifixion, right? No, it's actually, its real symbol is resurrection. The crucifixion side of it is what happens to us. It's Holocaust, it's child abuse. It's, those are all crucifixions. And they're terrible and horrible. Death, hurt of any kind, it's sad and horrible. But our job is resurrection, which is not sad and horrible. But how do you resurrect? By keeping people from not causing harm? No. It, internally, how, how am I going to teach you how to resurrect if I don't know how? How am I going to tell you you should resurrect? Resurrect meaning, I'm sorry that you lost your, your child, but now you have to bounce back. How do I tell you that if I don't even know it or feel it inside? If I don't feel it viscerally, if I don't tr know it as a truth, how am I going to preach that to you? It is preaching if I don't get it. And, you know, if you tell me, you know, you've lost someone, hang in there. Well, those are just words that, that people spout. But it makes a difference, doesn't it, when we really feel it, when we really get it and can say to somebody as you take their hand, I'm really sorry. And believe it or not, I understand and I've been there. That immediately creates a connection. Instead of just get over it, it's more like, I'm here with you. So it really helps for us to have descended in the constructive way, which means descend into yourself and look at what these things of the world bring up. Because if you can, if you can die well, going into the old self, looking into the hurts and things that have killed you emotionally, and give them, put them on the altar, kind of nice, you know, the symbolism. The Easter story, Jesus is put in the tomb and they find this cloth laying on the mantle when they come in to look for his body and he's not there. They find this cloth. Think of that as symbolism, like I've left my material body or material things like the burial cloth behind. It's like a nice symbolism. So what have you left behind when you were crucified? What, what, what did you leave behind about that marriage? Um, I think I'm done with narcissists. That's my burial cloth. I think I'm done with betrayal and being betrayed. And you leave that behind as your burial cloth because you've resurrected. And that's exciting. It's exciting to say, wow, you know, guess what? I've come back to life. Now, when you've come back to life, did you really? Remember, when Jesus comes back to life, the apostles don't believe it. They doubt it. Mary Magdalene is the first to actually believe it. And that was not even easy. Because, you, you know, it's easy to say it now because we look back and say, well, we remember the story about Jesus resurrecting. When it's never happened before and something like that happens, it's kind of freaky. And we're not just talking about, I had a vision of an angel. That's kind of sweet. We're talking about somebody that was nailed to a cross, gruesome, brutal, you know, spikes through the wrist and feet and all that. You're watching this guy bleed. Women are screaming and wailing in, in the loss of their, their son and friend and all this. There's, it's gloomy. Oh, but it's okay. Because he, he what? He just kind of resurrected. Where is he? He's walking around probably. I wonder if he's bleeding. You know, he might be losing blood, you know, if he's walking around. Like, it's gruesome and weird to imagine somebody just, you know, coming out of a grave. How would you feel when your dad went to a, a funeral? And all of a sudden, you're all looking at the grave. Oh, poor grandma, you know. Grandma, we loved you and thank you. All of a sudden, this hand reaches out from the grave. And, uh, you know, the dirt starts moving. Grandma comes back. Hey, don't worry about that. I just resurrected. Oh, okay, Grandma. Now we're all okay. Now that you've told us that's what you did. Creepy one coming out of the grave and all that with dirt all over your dress. You know, that would seem kind of weird. 
That's, it's, it was weird that it happened back then. But the people that doubted and were afraid are also you and me. We are doubtful and afraid that we can survive a crucifixion, a divorce, a death. Is it true? No. We, we, it's not true that you die and stay dead. It's true that you can resurrect. The other is a lie, but we've learned to believe it. So even though you'll have doubts and people around you will have doubts, if you seem too, too happy, they're going to go, oh, the poor thing, she's in denial, he's in denial. Because this world doesn't really get it. Well, God does, and that's all that matters. So going full circle with that, please remember that all that matters is what God thinks. And if you're not sure what that is, then just even just you know, drop it down a notch to your soul. What matters to my soul? I'm going to eat some food now, and what matters is exactly what's in it, not to my soul or God. That's to my body, but I am not a body, I am free, for I remain as God created me, which is what? I'm a spiritual being. So now all of a sudden, I probably don't need to mentally plant all kinds of guilt and weirdness into my food. I mean, your food is looking up at you from a plate going, what the hell did we do to you? Why do you hate us? You know, we're just cheesecake. And you're already worried about what, you're gonna, what we're going to do to you. You know, you're kind of weird. Um, so it's like, just come to a place of going, it, it's all okay. Today, um, all I can afford is this, food. Well, I wish I could afford more organic food. You know what? You just love the food. And you just drop into a place of love. And the, the, what you put into that food is going to make it better than any organic food you've ever eaten, if that's all you could afford today. Don't worry about these the, the uh, money mongrels even in the organic industry that are trying to make money off of you selling organic. Just say, I don't need you. I got love and that's all that matters. You know. And yes, surely, if you can afford more organic foods, sure, that's fine if that's what you did. And the same goes with relationships. No settling. Love first, God first. What would God think of this? You know, um, sleeping, does it matter to God? Think about it. I, so sleeping's an illusion. There's a bunch of Course in miracle lights out there, uh, the, those Course in Miracles purists, um, who are just as odd and, and scary as any other religious people. Um, you know, they try to indoctrinate, and they try to put fear in everything. But, and I say this not to be mean and rude to everybody. I just make it be, say that because it's so ridiculous, I just kind of laugh at it. And I know God laughs with me on this. You know how ridiculous people can be. So... You know, the Course in Miracle Lights would get really funny with you if you say, is sleep important? Well, sleep's an illusion. Your body's an illusion. They get all weird about that stuff. Well, the truth is this. In the illusion, God respects this, that even in the illusion, when we can turn something from hell to heaven, in the illusion, we are greater than any angel in that moment. Because angels are working miracles within the realm of light. When you can do it in the realm of darkness, you're really cool. Everybody on the other side is like, wow. You're like the star athlete, you know, that people worship on planet Earth. The angels look at you and go, hey, hey everybody, check this. They all come flying in to check it out. Check this out. A human being just turned darkness into light. Even angels don't necessarily work at that level. They work with light and bring light into our dark places. We're the ones who have to actually do the groundwork. We're the, the, you know, the, the forces that come in and do the groundwork. So the angels, to a degree, like Air Force, keep a distance and take care of things. They're the, the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the air element, as it were. And we're the ground forces on planet Earth, and we've got our job to do. So when we can sit and look at a plate of food and ask to see it, from a place of light, from the mind of God, you can turn food into bliss, which makes no sense because bliss is not a, a substance, nutrient. It is. People don't realize that love is a nutrient. Love is a thing, not just a feeling. Love is a thing. It's an action. It's a consciousness. It's a noun, an identity. Love is far more than people understand. And they sit around talking about, I love you and I love you. Oh, so It's so romantic. Uh, 99 point something or other percent of love on earth is a crock. It's just stupid. It's a crock. And uh, you, you guys just got me in the mood. Sorry, man. So I'm just, I'm just digging it. But it's a crock. All the things that people call romantic love have nothing, almost nothing at all to do with real love. 
other than it's a search for love, which is beautiful. But it's not real love. And you know how I know that? Because almost every human being has had romantic love at least once in their life that ended, right? Let me hear an answer, folks. Go ahead, you know, I'll hear you even over the internet. Do I hear an amen? Everybody you know and I know has had a relationship. 99 point something percent of them have had one person they loved that they stopped loving. Real love can never stop. I rest my case. Next, we're moving right along here. Keep in mind then that what matters is just ask, just in your own way, ask what matters to God and to your soul. I can't tell you what matters to your God and soul. I, you can't tell me. So if I say to you, sleep matters, you can say sleep's an illusion because it's of the body. You know what? But in the earth plane, the fact that if I sleep and I rest and I surrender my sleep to God and say, I rest in God, I've just made sleep a miraculous experience, not just a, a survival experience, not just a biological, um, psychological rest but it's a spiritual experience, then it becomes wonderful. So we're meant to turn, if you can imagine this, everything of this earth plane has to be transformed. We keep telling God to do it. You know, God, you, you know, please heal this and fix this and that. God's going, okay, well, what do you want me to fix? Um, that. God looks over at it and says, I don't get it. it. It looks holy to me. And we're saying, but it isn't. God says, sounds to me like you have a problem. Not because God looks at war and says, wow, isn't that cool, war. It's that it looks at that and God sees this when it looks at war and all the other atrocities on the planet, starvation as well as abuses. God looks at that and cannot see the act of hate that's in it. It cannot see the actual actions. I know that seems weird. What God sees, if you want to imagine God being like a clairvoyant, seeing energy like auras, God looks and sees only the energy auras of people that are longing for God so much that they're fighting. Not that they're fighting. God's not seeing the fight. It's seeing only the energy of longing for God. So God looks at that and says, I don't know what exactly they're doing because I'm not going to get into the flesh of it, but I can tell that by the auric energy that something's happening there that's a major search for God. And... The only thing I can do is give them God. So they're calling out for God. So here I am, everybody. Anybody want to, you know, wake up today and find me? And of course, they're busy hating and warring. So they may not find God. But you can, of course, be in the trenches of war and still find God. But generally, that's not the case. Generally, in a divorce, you can say, God, you know, help me. Uh, help me win this case. God doesn't say, well... Since you asked one more time than the other person, you get to win because you begged one more time, prayed one more time. That's not what happens. God doesn't look at somebody and say, well, I like that one more. God looks at the situation and says, everything is love or a cry for love. If it's love, isn't that wonderful? And if it's a cry for love, isn't that wonderful? Because the cry for love is only going to be answered with love. But God's saying, okay, granted. Okay, divorcees, you're in the middle of it. What's, what's the problem here? We're crying for love, Lord. We don't know it. What we think we're wanting is victory. No, I don't hear that. I'm hearing you really want God because all ever, anybody ever really wants is God. So what are you looking for? God. Granted. Now, of course, they're still fighting in the courtroom. And we go, well, we prayed for God. We, you know, we're praying for victory. We didn't get it. Um, you were really supposed to be praying for God. Did you find God? Because God said granted. God's going, well, I did grant it but your mind is close to it. You don't see it yet. Every prayer is already answered before you even pray, believe it or not. But you can't see it because usually, this is one of the weird things about prayer, usually when a person is praying for something, they're so busy with the problem, they cannot see the bliss on the other side of it. And no, I don't mean the bliss as some people tell you. Uh, look for the gift. You know, that's another one of those new age silly statements. Look for the bliss. Look, look for the good. So you had some really terrible things happen, but look for the good that you can get. That's, that's for people that are so small-minded, they have to like scratch out some little, eke out some little crumb so they can go, look at me. I had terrible things happen, but I found a positive out of it. I think that's great that they do that. But that's not 
actually what we're supposed to be doing. Because you can't find bliss by trying to rationalize irrational behaviors. You can't say this person was horribly, terribly abusive to me, but I'm gonna figure out some little tiny morsel lesson out of it and then say, gee, I guess it's all better now. It isn't. The horrible thing that happened, I'm really sorry that that happened. And we can say that to ourselves and we can say that to each other. First, let's just cry. Let's just be with it and not try to rationalize it. Let's just be with it and hold each other, man. Let's just get there. Then let's talk about it and what happened. Then let's talk about other times in our life when we felt betrayals and hurts. And let's get all that up. So once we're in the trench, we might as well get something done. So we go and we start digging all that stuff up, not for the purpose of just digging it up to commiserate, but bringing it up so that when we walk to the altar, it doesn't look like this. I've approached the altar of God. Hope you're watching. And what I would like today is to win in my court case. Just FYI, Lord, in case you love me, because you, you know, if you love me, I'll win, right? Or I haven't, you, I'm sick, Lord, I got my paperwork right here from the doctor. You know, in case you're watching and care, a cure would be really a nice thing today. We bring that to the altar, which is absolutely selfish and stupid. It's shallow because God doesn't see you as sick. God cannot fix your, your health the way you think it's to be fixed. God is saying, sure, you know, you, your mind works and you can use angels, you can use herbal cures and fix cancers and you can fix um, uh, leukemias and you can fix um, uh, kidney disease and whatever else. And you can say, well, God fixed it or you can say medicine fixed it. Whether this or that seems to be what fixed it, what changed in you? What we're supposed to be doing in our prayers is saying, this disease, this divorce is, is triggering my inability to know God because I'm scared and I'm angry. So what I need to do is use this as my vantage point, not God give me something, victory, it's God, I see that I'm being selfish in making this about me and my issue. What's really going on here is these are my blocks to knowing the love of God. So I'm gonna put them on the altar right now. Here I am, I mean, this is all I know. You've asked me to do my part, here it is. I'm gonna put this on the altar. I really am, am feeling sad and angry and so forth about what happened to my children or what happened to me and my disease or whatever. I'm putting it all on the altar. This is not the truth of God that I be sick. This is something that has happened to teach me something. What can I learn? And even if you don't know the details of what you're there to learn, put it on the altar and give it to God. And then say, you know what I want instead? Love, peace, joy, not fixed. Not God, give me my cure, bill of Ill, you know, good health. What we're supposed to be asking for is peace. And if you, even if your disease takes you to the other side, even if depression takes you to the other side, if you're asking for the peace of God, I promise you, you will find the peace of God. But if your goal is the peace of God and you die or live, you have done right. People on earth think, the surviving an illness is the victory, and it is not. Lots of people have been cured of illnesses, and they were still mean or cruel people afterwards. There's lots of people that have manifested wealth that aren't very nice people. So success of health, success of money, does not guarantee you internal success, and all that matters is God. So at the end of the day, what can I do to know God today? What can I do to be the presence of God in the lives of other people? And sometimes it's manifesting as soft-spoken and gentle and nurturing. Other times it, it's a little bit like standing up and saying something kind of more, you know, a bit more strong like I say. And I, I really, if you knew me, I don't say any of these things with kind of like hatred or, or intent, like a true judgment. When I say these things, it sounds like I'm being cruel or insensitive. That's only to, mostly to new agey people that don't want to hear the truth of anything. And I say new agey, I actually believe, um, I, I love the new age concepts that we're moving into a new age. Um, so don't get me wrong when I say that. Uh, I'm not picking on a people. I'm saying people that are bliss bunnies and they want to just, you know, think of everything just, you know, is wonderful and, and uh, Michael shouldn't say things that are so uh, to the point, but, you know, whatever. 
um, they can go to a Bliss Bunny um, Facebook group or a Bliss Bunny website. That would be, I think, great for them. But, you know, when people want to kind of hear something said a little more to the point, I mean, by the way, Jesus got to the point, so why shouldn't I? Uh, he's a good teacher, and I, I, that he's my, he's, you know, he's, the, he's my main man, man. He's, you know, I mean, considering he attained Christ consciousness, I don't know, call me silly, call me presumptuous, but might he be a good role model? I think. So the fact that he was able to call things and, and call hypocrisies and stupidities and abuses for what they were and say I, it's not something he would put up with, I think it's fine for us to do that. We just have to be careful that when we do speak up, we're not coming from our own wounds. You know, so that's why you don't hear me typically allying with one side or another. I'll talk about the two sides, but I really do my best to stay in the center and I recommend that to others. You know, I don't, I don't, you don't hear me promoting Republican or Democrat or masculine or feminine. Uh, I'll make fun of both because both can be ridiculous when seen from human eyes. But from divine eyes, you won't find those dualities. Divine eyes tend to draw everything to closure, to oneness, and in the oneness bliss. You know, and that's why I feel like a lot of people resonate with what I say because they, they can maybe feel the heart of what I mean behind what I'm saying, even, even if I get a little out there sometimes, and I apologize if it ever gets to be too much for y'all. Um, you know, I just still do my best to, to maintain center and know, uh, to teach what's as much truth as I know. Um, but in any case, as I'm coming, uh, drawing to a close, I really love that one of you wrote the other day, I think it was the Sunday service, it might have been the Friday night, they said, oh, you know, my heart sort of sank a little when Michael said, let's draw to a close, you know. Um, of course, the people holding the cameras are like, draw to a close, but, you know, but the people I'm um, watching a lot of times are like, whoa, you know, um, it's fine, man. I'm still here with you and I'm, we're still moving and grooving. So thank you for your time. Um, keep in mind that, like I said, what does matter? What really does matter in God, in your soul? Think about it. And you're the only one that can decide that. But, but do try to be honest. If you obsess on a TV show, fine, enjoy the show. But to obsess on it, does it matter to God? If it's an inspirational show like Joel Osteen or something, you know, I, I think it's beautiful. Um, there's, there's one or two uh, television um, spiritual personalities um, that I think are really beautiful. And uh, he's one of them. And I think he's great. Um, it's funny because you, you would think I might not think so. But if I had to choose between him and any, if I could honestly, honestly tell you this, if I had to choose between Joel Osteen, who's considered a Christian minister, between him and any new thought teacher on this planet, and I know a lot of them personally, and certainly have heard of and seen, I would, I would, I would pick Joel Osteen above and beyond any others uh, of the new age, the spiritual, to sit and listen to them for 30 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, five hours. Uh, I, he's, 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 he's honest. He's got integrity. Um, he's, he's doing his best to, to live in the light, and I think it's beautiful. I know there are others that do try to live in the light, even in the spirituality uh, departments and New Age departments. I, I know that. But um, he's the easiest one that comes to mind. And there are very few others that I feel have that, that depth of uh, the food that I think that could feed most souls. You could be a beginner or an advanced student on the path, and if you're humble, somebody like Joel Osteen really could speak to your soul, in my opinion. Um, I know a lot, man. I mean, I, I can just channel just about anything and yet I can sit and listen to the guy and be in awe, just in the beauty of the love. It doesn't matter if he knows as much about whatever, uh, dimensionalities and quantum realities as you or me or whatever. It's that what he does say is love, and that's what matters most. So it feeds the soul. So whenever I catch the guy or see him here, I would stop and watch from it for a minute because I think it's, it's good stuff. So check out what feeds your soul. Whether it's foods that most feed you, they make you feel invigorated, that's great. The Essenes used to use sprouts, and they would do sprouts for seven days, and at seven days they were at their peak maturity, and then they would make not only juices from them and, and or eat them raw, but they would actually take the sprouts and stroke them over the body because it would clear their energy field, but it also invigorated. It feeds the, the energy system around the body, the aura, the etheric double actually, and, uh, and then their body would absorb that and they would feel invigorated. So it was like a, um, a, an external 
charge to the systems and then ingesting it as well to get it internally. So, I mean, that's just using an example, um, sprouts. You're not gonna see me gnawing on sprout, sprouts anytime soon, but I can still tell you the truth and tell you that they're fantastic and they're invaluable to your, to your uh, systems, your body and all that. Um, love is even more valuable, but something like that is great. So if that feeds you and you feel invigorated, go for it. Um, the green juices and all those kinds of things people dig, go for it. A uh, high protein diet, if that's what you're into, go for it. Whether it's physical, sensual, intellectual, f things that feed your soul. If you have in uh, um, intimate encounters that don't feed your soul and you feel like you've uh, been, you know, just it, like you have regret or doubt or even just apathy or neutrality around the experience, maybe you should think twice about doing it. Maybe it needs to be when there's something where you feel more invigorated, you know, where you feel more alive. You should feel energized after sleep. You should feel a, a, looking forward to the day. After a prayer meditation, there should be, God, I just feel inspired. And if you paint a painting, it shouldn't be like, well, there's another painting. It should be like, wow, I mean, what a blessing to be a channel like this. And if you're not a channel, why the hell are you painting? You know, I'm, I'm doing mechanical, you know, painting that I learned in an art class. Well, let something else paint through you now. And if not, I can understand why your paintings bum you out. They bum me out too. You know, so foods, paintings, parenting, all the decisions we make in life, they should make us feel great. That's why when I'm talking um, and sharing, I, I feel fantastic when I'm doing a talk. Even if it's a talk that's deep and a little heavy emotionally on, on emotional topics, there's still a, a really great, great light about me and inside, I can feel it. And uh, that's because we're, we're doing the work, man. We're doing the real thing, we're living our soul's purpose. So please, live the life, find your soul's purpose, do what feeds your soul, and what you know matters most to God and, and soul. If you do something that doesn't matter, I'm not saying you should feel guilty and ashamed, but stop, go, hmm, if that doesn't feed God or my soul, or matter to God or my soul, then why am I doing it? Maybe learn from that and say, Okay, you know, I did learn from that, never again. And you can make a, a little pact with yourself to, to maybe not never, maybe you don't say never again, but maybe you say, it's time for me to watch for that and do my best to back off on that. Think about it, because this will feed the soul. And um, the last thing I wanna share is somebody had asked um, for me to talk about, I got a card today from you, thank you, and asked for me to talk about uh, pain and illness. It, you know, there's not enough time to cover that at, at, in depth, but it's related to what I've talked about today. Um, pain is not as much as what we think a physical thing. So let me say this kind of directly and briefly, but this is going to be important, so, so watch. In a sense, creation comes from the heavens, metaphorically through the body. From the heavens, there's light. And then it comes down in through our upper chakras, into our being, and it reaches our heart. And in our heart, it's, if our heart's wounded, if our heart is carrying heaviness, that, what, that which was pure light suddenly gets tainted with old, unhealed stuff in our heart, which you have and I have. How much stuff is in our heart will determine how much the light gets tainted or not. Um, or lifted for that matter, you could say, you know, because it becomes applicable inspirations in our heart. But otherwise it comes through and it gets a little heavy. Drops down into the solar plexus, drops down into the emotional centers, right? And then down into the root chakra. My point is, this is a metaphor of that which is pure light. By the time it comes in and reaches all the way to the root chakra, it gets twisted and turned and controlled and boxed and beat up by our unhealed wounds. That's obviously not a great thing, but it happens. So when it reaches the root chakra, it manifests energetically as our physical life and environment, circumstances. That's including illness. So when you have an illness, it never just happened. It's always something that was once pure light coming into your being and it got beat up, wounded, destroyed, made sick, coming through and manifesting as an illness. Whether it's a, an inflammation of a mild nature or a major problem, it manifests. And when we get this, then we realize you don't just get sick, which sounds like it happened to you. You manifest sick. You manifest aches. You manifest things. 
in my life. Um, I love this, you know, Spirit of God working through me. It's great, great, great. And that keeps me alive and it kept me, you know, as I'm going into late 50s, um, you know, uh, what am I going to be, 60 in a few years, let's say. So you go into late 50s and say, I never bothered eating health foods and nutrients. And I'm not bragging that. I'm saying I, I never felt like I needed to because what comes through me is light and it really feeds me. And it makes me immune to a lot of things. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that. At the same time, you don't jump off a cliff and say, God, catch me. So I'm also realizing at this time in my life, I realized, you know, I want to be careful to not go so far with um, decisions that are tempting the Lord, so to speak. Be, you know, because even God can say to me, you know, Michael, isn't that cool that you've already proven that you, you don't have to eat the things that they say you have to have. You know, my, my mother was told by a doctor when I was, I don't know, eight or 10 or something, um, he will not live another year or two if he doesn't eat differently. And, you know, it's now 50 years later and phew, here I am, you know, saying, you know, woohoo, a white chocolate Kit Kats and, and uh, Dr. Peppers and whatever my favorite things are, you know, um, because that's what matters most is the love. At the same time, I know God isn't saying, and isn't that great, Michael? Go ahead and keep pushing the envelope. Um, I don't need to. So I'm also aware that um, respecting the illusion comes in handy. So I, I'm, I'm also watching and making changes in my life and in certain things. But I know this, that when I thought about making these changes, I opened my mind to all the opinions and, and, and specialists and doctors and people and herbalists and whatever to give me their opinions. And um, it didn't actually do anything much for me. But I found that, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna just, I'm just gonna take care of myself here. And I'm gonna go back to you know, uh, pizza a couple times a week and uh, I have cookies every day of some kind or another, and, um, and I feel great. And I feel probably better than I have for years because uh, coming to Sedona was quite stressful in a lot of ways, and I noticed things really weighing down on me, you know, and, um, but you don't get sick, we manifest it. So as, as these events in life were, uh, were happening in and around, um, the heaviness and the weight that it carries, you know, um, was getting to me because sometimes I could be sensitive, too sensitive. And so it, it, it weighed and weighed and weighed. And so I had to kind of kind of do a spiritual sneeze to blow some of this away and just wait a minute, back off and say goodbye to some toxic kinds of scenarios. Healing my own stuff around that, but saying goodbye to certain people and you know people that pretended to be friends, even at Unity pretending to be friends and surround, oh, we're there for you. Um, People are going to say that to you, and of course they're there for you as long as they can get what they want from you. But to thine own self be true, to God be true. And then those, those people will disappear, and they did, and it's, now I feel great. So when it comes to illness and when it comes to pain, sometimes we have to kind of peel away <clears throat> um, people, uh, habits, events, but also our own old wounds. So these old things outside, they're not just outside, they also reflect things inside. So we do our own inner healing and then all of a sudden we come back to life and we're back to resurrecting again. So you're never meant to die, you're never meant to be in pain, you're never meant to be sick. But when these things do happen, do respect the illusion. It's okay to get a doctor's advice, it's okay to try these things out. I tried some different things out and found that they didn't really do anything for me, but I'm grateful that I, because I feel like it's good and important for us to be humble enough to try these things out. Instead of me saying, you know, well, I'm Michael and I'm a teacher and I don't need any of that. I think it's great. And I think it's great that people around me that know me close enough, that there's only a couple people that close, but that are around me, they were able to see that I did play the game and try those things out. And they can say, you're right. You, you tried this and that, and that didn't work for you. And back to pizza, man, and you're, you're doing really well. You know, um, I think it's important that they, that they saw that I tried that instead of them thinking that I'm trying to be um, special or above everybody else. So that's just a little personal thing there. But please know, the other way to say it, instead of it manifesting this way, take this with you for today. Now just picture this instead of a descent, I, I'm coming out. Deep in the core of your being is this divinity. As you take that divinity and start coming out, the more you materialize, 
the more you're going to materialize anything that stands between you and your absolute divine self. So if you have old wounds, picture it like this, if you have old wounds, um, let's say in my core I'm a divine being. Here comes the divine being, here it comes, here it comes, but then it runs into, my divinity runs into, I'm really angry about my last lifetime because somebody took my life and I didn't like it. I was uh, in the inquisitions and they killed me and burned me at the stake and all that. So here it comes. By the time my divinity, oh, you know, the angel choirs and the beautiful vibration, boom, you know, oh, angels fluttering. Here comes the divine me. And by the time I come out and manifest in this lifetime, I look like instead of, you know, I look like angry and my face looks a certain way and a furrowed forehead and a distrustful squinting eyes always looking for people that are out to get me. Why? Because the divine me has given way to the one that's been hurt. And so I don't look like this. I look like this. And all of your, your lines in your face, the lines in your hand, the body type, the body shape, the hips, the thighs, the weak knees, whatever you've got. Um, you know, uh, um, the, it's like bumps on the head. You can read. You can do psychic readings based on the bumps of the head. Socrates was one of the most malformed faces, heads. They said he was so freakish looking. You know, you think Socrates, so he's probably had some, you know, good looking God. No, he looked absolutely deformed, the elephant man of Greece. He had all these bumpy, knobby heads, but he was so ingenious, it manifested in the portion of the face, head, that represents the head. And it was all knobby and because he was so extra developed in that area of the head. So he looks malformed, but it's actually a hyper thinker. It's beautiful when you see it that way. And the person with the nose and the nose symbolizes, it could be a nose for money, but the nose symbolizes prosperity. Could be. It can also be a different kind of a nose that represents something else, nosy, you know? So you don't just say, well, I have a big nose, that means I should be prosperous. No, it may be just because you're a nosy type of person. Um, and on and on and on. Ears represent wisdom. It's always in the Far East. They, they're seen as a symbol of wisdom. You'll see uh, statues of Buddha, really usually large ears and the ear lobes draped way down. It's, they're all symbols. So before you manifested the large ears, something happened between your original divinity and manifestation. Sometimes good things happen. I love wisdom, the ears develop. I love sensuality and something, you know, uh, some other region, you know, that just represents sex and beauty or whatever it is. It could be your eyes or whatever. I'm not going to get into all that. But, you know, your health, your spiritual health will manifest sometimes as your physical health. But your wounds and hurts of the past will manifest in your body. And it will happen to the best of us. It happened to Buddha. It'll happen to you. It can manifest as an accident. Not because you're a bad person. Peace Pilgrim died in a car accident. She was a really beautiful soul. But something's on earth, on earth is going to kill you. Right? So it's okay. You don't say, oh, well, they died so they're not holy. Don't get into judgments like that. Something's going to take you out. So that's okay. However, on earth, our feeling pain is never God's will. It's always a manifestation of something unhealed inside. If it weren't there, it wouldn't have manifested as a thing. It would be invisible because it wouldn't exist. So all we ever see on the outside, and by outside I include the body, and inside the body, is it, all manifestations come from our beliefs and thought systems. If they're beautiful, then they're reflecting light coming through us really well, so good job. If they're not so beautiful, they're representing stuff and issues. That's the bottom line. And when we can help each other and say, you know, um, this is very interesting, but when we say to people in our hearts, that your struggle is my struggle, not because I'm being codependent, but, but picture this, this is a beautiful thing, guys, I swear to God. When Jesus healed people, when you bring somebody to Jesus in the old days or now, if you bring somebody to Jesus and say, Jesus, this person is sick. Now let's pretend you lived 2000 years ago or Jesus happens to manifest in your living room right now. And you say, I want you to please, Jesus, please heal my um, mentally ill family member. Heal me from a disease, whatever it is. But let's pretend it's somebody else for now. Heal this person. Jesus would possibly do that. But here's what Jesus would be saying to you. This is very cool, please. Jesus would say to you, 
Okay, and he heals that person. And if you asked him, here's what he would say. I went ahead and healed them, but you know how I did it? Oh, well, because you're Jesus and you're in, touch, you're in touch with God. And No, no. You have energy, but no. Because you know the scriptures, no. You're a master, no. Then Jesus, how did you heal them? Well, why couldn't you heal them? Well, I don't know how to do that. Yes, you do. You just don't want to know. Jesus would tell you this. The reason I was able to heal that person that you weren't able to heal is because I was willing to see something and you were not willing to see. But what do you mean? There's a divine being in them. And all I had to do was look at them and say, nice to see you, the real you, and the real you can't be sick, so therefore, gone. And the person's healed. That's how it's done. Healing is not, well, I have special techniques. That's why when I've taught in my workshops or at Unity of Sedona, wherever I teach, I really haven't let people make me into the healer. I just keep trying to, you know, work with people and teach them about healing so that they can do that. There's no reason that for them to follow me. Why would you need to follow me? Uh, I'm just following Christ. And if you do that, we're all good, right? So remember that, please. Your ability to heal yourself and others is the same ability that even somebody like Jesus has. And that is all we need to do is think like Christ, which means, and you can't think like Christ. You can never think like Christ or be like Christ if you're not willing to see the Christ in others. So simultaneously, I'm choosing to be the Christ and I can prove it because of my willingness to see the Christ in that other person. When I do, that person is changed. Now, what Jesus might be able to manifest as that healing could be instantaneous healing of any disease. For you, maybe today, if you're only getting this 20%, then you might be able to manifest just this. Maybe when you look at that person and see light in them and you smile, all you did was heal them a little bit, 20%, because you were able to smile and give them a little twinkle in your eye and it made them feel loved today. So you still help them heal. Maybe not to the full capacity of Jesus or Christ, but to the best of your ability and I think it's great. I do, I think it's fantastic. So do what you can to see the God, the true God in everybody. There's people that say they see God and they don't. I'm saying let's be humble and do our best to see the light in everyone, the God presence in everyone. Oh, how do you do that? I'll tell you, it's very simple. Ask God to help you do it. Think if you can do it on your own. Oh, I know how to do it. I'm going to look at them and I'm going to picture their aura and I'm going to imagine a little flicker of light. In That's still you in your head conjuring it. Just go to humble, man. Just go, I don't even, I don't know how. What am I supposed to do again? See the Christ in others. Oh, okay, oh, yeah, I'm seeing the Christ. No, just say, I, have, I haven't the foggiest idea. You can have attitude with it. Pfft, Michael, with this crap about seeing the Christ. What the hell does that mean? All right, God, me, Joe Blow. I'm, by the way, I'm still a smoker and drinker in case you haven't noticed. And I'm gonna try to see the Christ in somebody else. But you probably don't care because I'm still a smoker and drinker and my church says you judge smokers and drinkers. But here I am and I'm going to try to see the Christ in others. And all you have to say is, and I don't know how, but go ahead and show me. And I promise you, magic will happen. You may get 1%, you may get 100% success. But something will happen because the humility, which is the divine feminine in us, gives birth to the Christ in us. So just the humility will make something happen. Many blessings to you, and take a moment to just have a couple of deep breaths and take in what you've heard, not in your head, but breathe it into your being. It's symbolically done by breathing it into your lungs, your heart, your, your chakra, you know, heart chakra, your, your cells of your body, but really it's, that's all symbolic of breathing in, into your being. Um, can't tell you how much I appreciate all of you for, for being a part of this kind of a message um, and any of us know that when we get to fulfill our soul's purpose and that there's people that help us do that oh my god words of gratitude really are never enough but i still got to say it all the time many blessings god bless you all and know that in the name of our father mother god and in the name of the christ that we are all is well peace be with you we'll see you soon bye bye